Well, hello. Hello again. Um, <clears throat> we are going to continue from where we left off before we were so rudely interrupted by the power outage. Um, so we, I think we left off on chapter 27. So we're gonna just, just going to read chapter 27 in this segment, and then we'll get back to our um, you know, three chapters a day. It's okay, because chapter 27 is kind of long, so it's almost like a couple of chapters in and of itself. Okay, chapter 27. <clears throat> James Henry Trotter and his companion crouched close together on top of the peach as night began closing in around them. The clouds, like mountains, towered high above their heads on all sides, mysterious, menacing, overwhelming. I love that sentence. Gradually, it grew darker and darker, and then a pale three-quarter moon came over the tops of the clouds and cast an eerie light over the whole scene. The giant peach swayed gently from side to side as it floated along, and the hundreds of silky white strings going upwards from the stem were beautiful in the moonlight. So also was the great flock of seagulls overhead. There was not a sound anywhere. Traveling, in the, traveling upon the peach was not the least like traveling in an airplane. The airplane comes clattering and roaring through the sky when it, when it, and whatever might be lurking secretly up in the clouds uh, in, the, in the great cloud mountains, goes running for cover at its approach. That's why people, of, <clears throat> people who travel in airplanes never see anything. But the peach, ah yes, the peach was a soft, stealthy traveler, making no noise <clears throat> at all as it floated along. And several times during the long, silent ride, high above the, high above the middle of the ocean, in the moonlight, and James and his friends saw things that no one had ever seen before. Once, as they drifted silently past a massive white cloud, they saw on top of it a group of strange, tall, wispy-looking things that looked about twice the height of an ordinary man. They were not easy to see at first because they were almost as white as the cloud itself, but as the peach sailed closer, they, began, they became obvious that these things were actually living creatures, tall, wispy, wraith-like, shadowy white creatures who looked as though they were made of a mixture of cotton wool and candy floss uh, and thin white hair. Oh, the ladybug said, I don't like this at all. Shh, James whispered, James whispered back, don't let them hear you. They must be cloud men. Cloud men? they murmured, huddling, uh, huddling, huddling together for comfort. Oh dear, oh dear. I'm glad I'm blind and can't see them, the earthworm said, or I would probably scream. I hope they don't turn around and see us, Miss Spider stammered. Do you think they would eat us? The earthworm asked. They would eat you, the centipede answered, grinning. They would cut you up like a salami and eat you in thin slices. Poor earthworm began to quiver all over around with fright. But what are they doing? The old green grasshopper whispered. I don't know, James answered softly. Let's watch and see. The cloud men were all standing in a group and they were doing something peculiar with their hands. First, they would reach up all of them at once and grab handfuls of cloud. Then they would roll these handfuls of cloud in their fingers until they turned what, until they turned into what looked like white, large white marbles. Then they would toss the marbles to the other side and quickly, quickly grab more bits of, co of cloud and start over again. It was all very silent and mysterious. The pile of marbles soon began to grow larger and larger and soon there was a truckload of them at least. They must be absolutely mad, the centipede said. There's nothing to be afraid of here. Be quiet, you pest, the earthworm whispered, or we shall be see we shall be eaten we should all be eaten if they see us. But the cloud men were much too busy with with uh, with what they were doing to have noticed the great peach floating silently behind them. Then the watchers on the peach saw one cloud man raising a long wispy arm above his head, and they heard him shouting, All right, boys, that's enough. Get the shovels! And the other cloud men immediately and the other cloud men immediately let out a strange, high-pitched whoop of joy, and started jumping up and down and waving their arms in the air. 
and they picked up enormous shovels, rushing over to the pile of marbles and began shoveling them as fast as they could over the side of the clouds into space. Down, down, down they go. They chanted as they worked. Down they go, hail and snow, freezes and sneezes and noses will blow. It's hailstones, whispered James excitedly. They're, they've been making hailstones and now there are shadows of, they're, they're showering them down on the people in the world below. Hailstones, said the centipede. That's ridiculous. It's, this is summertime. You wouldn't have hailstones in summertime. They are practicing for winter, George, uh, James told them. I don't believe it, shouted the centipede, raising his voice. Shh, the others whispered, and James said softly, for heaven's sake, centipede, don't make so much noise. The centipede roared with laughter. These imbeciles couldn't hear anything, he cried. They're as deaf as doorknobs. You watch. And before anyone could stop him, he had cupped his front feet to his mouth and was yelling at the cloud men at the top of his, as loud as he could. Idiots, he yelled. Nincompoops, half-wits, half balderheads, asses. What on earth do you th think you're doing over there? The effect was immediate. The cloud men jumped around as if they had been stung by wasps, and when they saw the great golden peach fl floating past them, not 50 yards away in the sky, they gave a yelp of surprise and dropped their shovels to the ground. And there they all stood with the moonlight streaming down all over them, absolutely motionless. Like a group of tall, white, hairy statues staring st and staring at the giant fruit as it went sailing by. The passengers on the peach, all except Centipede, sat frozen with terror, looking back at the cloud men and wondering what was going to happen next. Now you've done it, you loathsome pest, whispered the earthworm to the centipede. I'm not frightened of them, shouted the centipede. And to show everybody once again that he wasn't, he stood up in his full height and started dancing about and making insulting signs at the cloud men with all 42 of his legs. This evidently infuriated the cloud men beyond belief. All at once, they spun around and grabbed great handfuls of hailstones and rushed to the edge of the cloud start and started throwing them at the peach, shrieking with fury all the time. Look out, cried James. Quick, lie down, lay flat on the deck. It was lucky they did. A large hailstone can hurt you as much as a rock or a lump of lead if it's thrown hard enough. And my goodness, how these cloud men could throw. The hailstones kept came whizzing by through the air like bullets from a machine gun. And James could hear them smashing against the side of the peach and burying themselves in the peach flesh with a horrible squelching noise, plop, 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 plop. And then ping, 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 as they bounced off a poor ladybug's shell because she couldn't lie as flat as the others. And then crack. One of them hit the centipede right on the nose and crack as another one as another one hit him somewhere else. Ow, he cried. Ow, stop, stop, stop. But the cloud men had no intention of stopping. James could see them rushing about on the cloud like a lot like like a a lot of huge hairy ghosts picking up hailstones from the pile, dashing to the edge of the cloud, hurling the hailstones at the peach, dashing back again to get more. And then when the pile of stones was all gone, they simply grabbed handfuls of cloud and made as many more as they wanted and much bigger ones now. Some of them as large as cannonballs. Quickly, cried James, down the tunnel or we all be wiped out. There was a rush for the tunnel entrance and half a minute later, Everybody was safely downstairs inside the stone of the peach, trembling with fright and listening to the noise of the hailstones as they came crashing against the side of the peach. I'm a wreck, groaned the centipede. I'm wounded all over. It serves you right, said the earthworm. Would somebody kindly look at and see if my shell is cracked, the ladybug said. Give us some light, shouted old green grasshopper. I can't, wailed the glowworm. They've broken my bulb. But then, then put in another one, said the centipede. Be quiet a moment, said James. Listen, I do believe they're not hitting us anymore. 
They all stopped talking and listened. Yes, the noise had ceased. The hailstones were no longer smashing against the peach. We've left them behind. The seagull must have must have pulled us out. The seagulls must have pulled us out out of the way of danger. Hooray! Let's go up and see. Cautiously, with James going first, they all climbed back up the tunnel, and James poked his head out and looked around. It's all clear, he called. I can't see them anywhere. So the centipede. Uh, I was reminded in um, in one of our, one of the stories that we read. Um, I think it was, I think it was on the, one, the the book that we had on characters' actions and reactions. Was there a character that we've read, maybe specifically in that book, that the centipede reminded you of? What do you think? Because I do. I, I think about the gnat and the lion. Remember that? And remember what happened to the gnat when the gnat got too prideful. Remember, we talked a lot about that. And um, is the is the uh, centipede, is he prideful? He is, huh? I mean, he, he just thinks he's all that. He's proud that he's a pest. He's proud that nobody likes him. Um, he loves that and takes a lot of pride and joy in that. Um, but because of that, what, did end up, what ended up happening, well, there was consequences for that pride, right? He and the, the others got bombarded with, um, you know, really painful balls of hail. So that's a good lesson for all of us. It's like, yeah, not only do we want to not have pride within us, as that fable did when we were reading the, the, um, the gnat and the lion, but you may want to question like who you hang out with too, because if you hang out with somebody who's kind of you know, a pride, arrogant, prideful, arrogant person, you might end up getting hurt too. You might end up getting caught in a situation like James and the others did, um, not because of anything that they did, but because of the actions of the green grasshopper. So, you know, there's always so many great, um, great things to learn in books and literature and really good literature. And it's not just the story that's entertaining, which it is, but within it, we learn how to write really good sentences. I mean, Roald Dahl does, does a fantastic job of, of crafting really good sentences, but, but there's also some important themes that come up. And like the one that did today where, you know, <laughs> pride can be a pretty bad thing and um, it, it has consequences that affect the people around us. So anyway, that is it for today. I hope you guys are doing well. Tomorrow, um, tomorrow we will do 28, 29, and 30. 28, 29, and 30. And then next week, we will finish this book up for sure, maybe even by midweek next week. So um, anyway, I'm enjoying this. I read it every year and I still enjoy it every single year. Um, so uh, I hope you are as well. So I hope you guys are well. I do miss you guys. I love you. And I will talk to you hopefully later. Bye-bye.